Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining and for this EBETA conversation and policy organized by the Center for Civil Society. We have Dr. Per, By per Byland with us. Um, a quick introduction about CCS. So Center for Civil Society is a New Delhi-based public policy think tank that envisions a world where every individual leads a life of choice in personal, economic, and political spheres, and every institution is accountable. We at CCS advance social change through public policy. Our work in education, livelihood, terracotta environmentalism, science and technology, and policy training promotes choice and accountability across private and public sectors. Today, for this eBet hug on the topic economics, yesterday, today, and tomorrow, we have with us Dr. Pai Byland, who is an associate professor of entrepreneurship and records Johnston Professor of Free Enterprise in the School of Entrepreneurship at the Oklahoma, Oklahoma State University. His areas of research are entrepreneurship, management, and economic organization. He is author and editor of four books. And very interestingly, he describes his work as business scholarship with a Swedish Austrian twist. We're very happy to host you, Dr. Byland. Um, over to you. But just a quick note before that, um, we will be taking questions towards the end and we'll be sharing a Slido link. So for the audience, um, for your questions, just visit the link and you can add your question there. And you can also upvote the questions that you'd like. Um, with that, over to you, Pair. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. This is gonna be very exciting, I think. Um, let me just share the presentation. Can you see this? Yes. Perfect. All right, so what I'm going to talk about is, I'm gonna basically give you a quick uh, go through of economic history and future, um, just like Samrita mentioned. And I'm gonna go back to back some 300 years and quickly skip ahead until the present day and what I expect for the near future. Um, it's gonna be a little bit of a different take. Uh, as you heard, I'm a professor of entrepreneurship, which is, it seems a little bit odd if you're um, giving a lecture on economics, but I have a background in economics. So my PhD is in applied economics. Um, I think entrepreneurship is however, core to understanding economics, the economy, and especially the market economy. You cannot have a market economy without entrepreneurship. So that, that's the, the first major point where I sort of deviate from, from a mainstream economics. If you take an economics course at a university, you will basically not talk about entrepreneurship at all. Instead, you will um, look at models and equilibrium uh, and you will shift curves back and forth, but you will not really talk about how those curves shift. And you will also not talk about where the, all the products and, and services come from or how how the economic system renews itself and, and things like that. That's not really part of the economics discussion. Economics has become a, 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 an analysis of static systems, an analysis of models with very uh, stringent and, and sometimes rigorous uh, assumptions. Whereas the market economy, the way I see it and the way Austrian economists see it um, is it's really a process, it's not a system. So it's not static, uh, it's dynamic, and it's not uh, in equilibrium, but it's in disequilibrium and so forth. And, and this is actually, uh, the reason I mentioned this is not only because I, I identify as an Austrian economist, it's also that this is the traditional view of the economy, not as a static state, but as, as something that is going on and, and something that is changing all the time. And viewing it as a process makes a whole lot of sense but it makes it really difficult to use mathematical models. Uh, and it makes it very difficult to make predictions that are accurate as well. And we see this, this of course, when economists make predictions, I, I have heard that there's a joke in sociology that if you ask an economist, uh, you will get a very precise answer. Uh, the only thing you know about that answer is that it's not right, it's, it's gonna be wrong. Uh, and, and the reason for that is simply that the, the economy is such a dynamic system. It's, it's always in, in movement. It's always changing. It's always fluctuating, uh, which means you can't really say what the future is going to hold. Uh, and, and that's very different from, say, a natural science, where, where you can predict, you can produce uh, limited experiments, you can control uh, different influences, different variables. So you can study, say, gravity 
uh, in different settings, uh, and you can you can um, uh, separate gravity and the, the effects of gravity from other sources of, or other influences. In the economy, you cannot because the economy is simply people acting on their valuations of different things and valuations of different end states that they see, and also based on their 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 facts and information that they have at hand and their interpretation of those facts. And, and since we're acting and reacting on each other, this is this is a very difficult um, thing to predict if it is at all possible. Okay, so, um, oh, and also uh, as Samruta mentioned that I'm, I, I, I say on my website that I, I do research with a Swedish-Austrian uh, twist. And the reason for that is that I'm Swedish uh, from Sweden originally where I spent my first three decades, a little more. And now I'm a professor in the United States. Um, but I, I do mostly Austrian economics. So I'm, you can say I'm an American Swede uh, doing Austrian economics. So if we go back, uh, and this is what we're going to talk about today, I'm going to go back and talk about pre-Austrian economic theorizing. The Austrian school was founded in 1871, and we'll get back to that. But before then, of course, there was plenty of economics. And I think it's important to understand what that economic thinking uh, actually looked like and how that is different from mainstream economics today. And then we'll go to talking about the Austrian school and Austrian economics, how that is, how that it has, has shaped economics as we see it today, in a sense, and how Austrians have always been uh, an important part of those grand debates that have happened in economic thinking. So you might, you might have heard of, of, of different discussions that have lasted for a very long time in economics, trying to figure out how things work or figure out if some, some concept is possible or the nature of this phenomenon and, and things like that. And those debates in, in academia and in theorizing can go on for very long times. Uh, they can, well, be, people can be very upset about things and they can debate these things uh, very fiercely for very long times. And economics has sort of been shaped by these debates and, 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 and everything that we have discovered through uh, pitting these ideas against each other. And throughout the, the life of the Austrian school of economics, it has been part of or even started many of these grand debates. So it has usually taken one uh, position and then most, most others have sort of taken the other position. So it's been Austrians versus the rest in a sense, if you, I exaggerate a little bit, but, but still the, these debates have shaped both mainstream economics and Austrian economics at the same time. Uh, then we'll get into sort of the decline of the Austrian school after World War II from approximately 1950. We'll talk a little bit about what that looked like coming up to uh, our present day where we see a renaissance and a renewal of the Austrian school. There's a, a new interest in Austrian economics uh, that has grown very rapidly for the past decade or so. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about where that comes from, why that is the case. Um, and I'll talk also about where the Austrian school is going and where I think economics itself must be going in order to, again, become relevant. Uh, so as you will see, uh, there, there are differences here between the Austrian school, which discusses how the market economy actually works. That's the, that's the point. Uh, and the main, mainstream economics, which has more or less become a, a policy recommendation or policy assessment tool. Um, it's, it's not as much about explaining what is going on in the economy as it is about figuring out which policy is going to be better than, than, than other alternatives. Okay, so if we go to the very beginning, uh, the guy on the right here is uh, Adam Smith. He's usually referred to as the father of economics, which is it's sort of not true. Um, the reason I say that is that you might, might have heard of his, um, his magnum opus in economics, The Wealth of Nations, published in 1776. It's usually considered to be the starting point of modern economics, the way we see it. And it was used for about 100 years as the main text. So uh, economists were basing pretty much everything on Adam Smith's work. So if you read, say, um, Karl Marx, who 
would disagree with Adam Smith on a lot of things, the starting point for Karl Marx's uh, economic theorizing is still Adam Smith. So, so when Karl Marx was talking about exploitation and so forth, uh, what he did was base that off of Adam Smith's discussion on, on division of labor and productivity and those things. Um, uh, so, so Marx and everybody else basically for 100 years started with Adam Smith. So the influence, you can't really exaggerate the influence of Adam Smith uh, over economics for, for those 100 years, but it didn't actually start with Adam Smith. So the first uh, economics treatise that was ever published um, and written uh, was Richard, Richard Cantillon's essay, an essay on commerce, in which he tries to explain what is going on in the economy. So Richard Cantillon was, was a, a banker and investor, uh, but he, he was very perceptive uh, and understood a lot of things about the economy. What's interesting with Cantillon is that he started, he got, got the economic thinking sort of started. The economics, I mean, understanding the economy has obviously always been an important part of, of understanding the world. So philosophers have always, uh, they've always discussed how the economy works. So you can go back to the ancient Greeks and, and, and even further than that and, and see how they reason about how the, the market works, how the economy works, how, what prices are and things like that. But it's always a part of some other discussion. So it's always a part of a, say, a theory of society or maybe a theory of ethics and so forth. It, economics was not a field uh, in itself until, until Adam Smith, pretty much. But Richard Cantillon wrote the first book and <clears throat> Cantillon explained the economy as an entrepreneurship driven economy. So at the very core, you have entrepreneurs who are to Cantillon, the people who have, who know their, the costs of their endeavor, but don't know the incomes. So uh, for instance, a farmer would be able to, to esti estimate the cost of, of, of planting seeds in the field and watering them and so forth and, and harvesting, that cost can, can be estimated. That cost can be known beforehand, but you cannot know exactly the selling price of the, whatever it is you're, you're growing on your field. And many types of work uh, in Kentian's discussion are like this, that the costs are known, but the incomes are not, which means that you have to bear the uncertainty. You have to figure out how to best serve your customers so that you can get a higher price. Kentian's work was, was very influential and the manuscript was, the unpublished manuscripts, I should say, was uh, circulated among a, a lot of scholars back in the day. It was written around 1730 or so, uh, but it was not published until 1755 after Cantillon's death. Um, part of it was because it couldn't go through uh, the censorship of the French king, Cantillon was living in France, but it was well known among scholars and, and many scholars had, had read his work and Adam Smith even cites Cantillon in with the Wealth of Nations, which is sort of interesting because Adam Smith um, doesn't cite a whole lot of people. So there are very few references, especially for being such a thick work uh, that the Wealth of Nations is. Um, but some of, of those references are to Cantillon. So that's how important he was even to Adam Smith. Now, following after Cantillon and Adam Smith, uh, there was sort of a, a, a surge of economic thinking. And I, I really love this period because it has a lot of, of very interesting discussions and debates. And they're trying to tease out how the economy works in itself. So they recognize that the, the economy is sort of not separate from society, but it lives a life on its own. Uh, Adam Smith famously talked about the invisible hand, which by which he really meant that people respond to incentives and people respond to prices. So if prices of one good goes up, people tend to buy less of that good and they buy more of something else. So they shift their actions and their activities uh, in that sense. And also on the other side, on the production side, that if prices of some good goes up and and people expect that price to be up or be higher for a while, they would probably go into producing that thing more than producing other things. So in this sense, resources are allocated where they do most good and consumers get as much value as they can. Uh, they're trying to figure this out uh, and, and understand all the details of what is going on. So you have plenty of, of interesting thinkers. Jean-Baptiste Say in, in France talked uh, a bunch about entrepreneurship and things like that. You had David Ricardo uh, with comparative advantage. Uh, you have 
father and son mill and other people and they were trying to figure out uh how the economy works and they they sometimes refer to the economy as an <clears throat> excuse me as an organism what they meant by that was that simply the, the invisible hand thing that that it 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 is moving it is changing it has its boundaries but it's sort of alive in a sense that the, it is trying to um it's trying to figure out how to produce more value, how to be more productive. And it's also trying to figure out how to use less of resources. So it's economizing uh, in the present on those resources that we have and that we think that we can produce at the same time as it is trying to figure out how to use these in the most value creative way for consumers. And you, it, it sort of finds its own way uh, through the many decentralized actions and activities of people and you don't really need anyone to steer this process and, and in fact if you try to steer it uh, there's a great risk that you might actually end up destroying things rather than uh, than creating more value so it's you should always have sort of a, a tempered uh, approach to trying to meddle with this thing just like with an organism that if you you can in an experiment, uh, work on, on organisms and work on, on animals, say, but that usually means that you're, the animals suffer uh, and you might even kill the animal. And that's it's simply not worth it with the economy because we are all part of the economy. So in a sense, you, sh you should, and, and these guys are sort of very humble and, and they are hesitant to use uh, simple measures to try to create advanced results because they realize that this is a very a, a complex thing and you can't really ex predict exactly what the outcomes are going to be. So there's at the same time as you have this sort of this movement, a hundred years of, of grand theorizing, it's all really about, um, in a sense, social social theorizing and, and reasoning about what the how the economy works. Um, in a sense, it's cl close to philosophy, but it's, it's focused on, on economic matters. At the same time, you have a, a, what I call the dark side of economics, which is a tradition that, that looks at the economy very differently. They, they usually um, identify inherent contradictions uh, so that the, the economy needs to be helped by government or, or the economy will just uh, go down the tubes. And you see some of the names, you probably re uh, recognize some of them. Uh, Sismondi, Malthus, Marx, and Keynes, they, they sort of represent the dark side. Now, these guys on both sides, both the, both the good guys and the bad guys, so to speak, they, they had some issues and they, they couldn't solve. And one was the diamond water paradox. What that means is simply that they couldn't really figure out why is it that water, which is necessary for us to survive, and therefore should be super important, costs so little to buy. Whereas diamond, which is pretty much useless for us, costs so much. So yeah, there's supply and demand and that sort of thing, but shouldn't we be uh, uh, willing to buy, to buy water for a whole lot higher price, especially compared to diamonds? So they couldn't really figure this out because they hadn't discovered what we today call the marginalist analysis. So they didn't didn't figure that we value something on the margin, which means in this case that you value water for each unit of water that, that you uh, buy. So if you have already satisfied a number of wants using water, then the next unit is not very valuable to you. And because it's not very valuable, you're not willing to spend a whole lot in buying that unit of water. But had you say been uh, in, the, in the desert, then one unit of water would be worth a whole lot for you. So you would then value water much, much more highly. But because water is um, so plentiful to most of us, even though it's so valuable, but because we have so much of it, we have already and can easily satisfy many valued wa uh, uses uh, for water. So that's why we wouldn't value the next unit very highly. That's why water is basically free, even though our lives depend on it. But the, these guys, the, the sort of classical economists, they couldn't solve this because they haven't, had not discovered um, the, uh, the marginalist analysis quite yet. That happened 
1871 with Carl Menger's uh, magnum opus, Principles of Economics. Carl Menger is, is considered the founder of the Austrian school because he wrote the book that started the whole uh, discussion uh, and started the whole, well, the, the tradition of theorizing on the economy the way Austrians do. Um, there were three gentlemen at the very same time in the early 1870s who discovered marginalist analysis. So Menger was not alone. Um, there was also Valras uh, in France and, and Jevons in the UK, but they had a little bit different takes on it. Not, not different uh, in terms of marginal analysis, but different in terms of how to interpret this uh, and how to go about and analyzing this. To Menger, uh, it was very clear that value is subjective. What that means is simply that, that however we choose to act, we act in order to attain something that we personally consider a value. Whether other people consider it a value doesn't really matter. It, what matters is that we consider it a value. And it, it, we can't also say that something is objectively valued because there is no objective measure of value because value is simply our satisfaction, the satisfaction we get of, of, of being in a better place or, or, or satisfying a want so we don't have that want anymore. And of course, if we are to explain how people act, then it makes a whole lot of sense to, to uh, uh, adopt value subjectivity because that will explain how, how people act. What they're always, we're always in an action trying to attain something. What are we trying to attain? Well, something that we consider of value, whether we're right or wrong, whether this will actually uh, satisfy us, whether this will actually make us better off on our own terms. Well, that remains to be seen. We make a whole lot of mistakes, but what motivates our action is our subjective valuation of something. So that was a core part of, of the principles of economics in Menger, and it's still a core part in, in Austrian economics. And it's sort of a, also a, a uh, assumption in economics overall that yes, People value things subjectively. That's why they act in a certain way. But then uh, mainstream economics, um, they, they, they sort of deviate from this and they say that, well, assuming that we can put this in a utility function and use math to calculate things and compare people and so forth, then, then, then let's do all this math. Austrians say that, well, this, you, can, you can do that for yourself, uh, enter, your, your own entertainment if you like, but it's not really analysis because you're assuming something that is not real and you're assuming something that is so far from the truth that it, it it's, has no relevance anymore. So instead, we need to understand subjectivity and understand the structure of how people act and the reasons for it so we can then understand the economy overall. And the point is to Austrians to explain the economy the way it actually works. Not, not explain the economy compared to some model that is sort of outlandish. So Karl Menger was quickly uh, drawn into, or maybe he started it depending on who you ask, uh, a big discussion. One of those, the first grand debate between Austrian economists and others, this was with the German historical school uh, on method. So Austrians, um, they, they sort of follow the tradition of the older, uh, economists and the classical economists in the sense that Austrians reason about the economy and Austrians reason deductively. So we have assumptions about how people act and how people behave. And then from those assumptions, we can derive uh, truths about what must be the case in the real economy because those, if those assumptions are true, what logically follows must also be true. And then we can use that as a framework for studying and understanding um, the actual empirical real world. The German historical school was of a, of a very different view. To them, um, there was no, no, no way you could have a theory at all. So all you had was basically data. So you could, but you could not have a universal theory and the theory did not apply uh, such a theory would, could not apply to a different phenomena or over time. So instead, all you had was just a, a bunch of data. So you could study the data for each situation, um, but and you could learn about that situation, but you couldn't really formulate a, a theory, especially not in the sense that, that Austrians do about the economy. And this was a, a long-lasting debate, as all of these, these are, um, where, where Austrians... Um, 
well, very clearly took the meth uh, took the uh, uh, theory first approach, where sort of empirical analysis in a later uh, reformulation of the same thesis, in a sense, um, Mises in what he called praxeology, which is just a, the the uh, deductive economic theorizing, um, took the view that well, empirical uh, studies are important for understanding a specific. A phenomenon or a specific time or, or something like that, like the Great Depression, to understand exactly what was going on during the Great, Great Depression, you need to look at the data. That's very important. However, to understand booms and busts and those business cycles, the data will not help you because the data are very specific to that um, instance. And in order to even understand what to look for in the data, we need a theory first. So Austrians are theory first, empirics later. And empirics are only used to explain a, a specific situation, whereas theory, uh, to the extent that it's, it's logically stringent and the assumptions are accurate, theory is and must be true. It's that simple. So you start with theory and thereby you can, you can conduct empirical analysis if, if you like and if you feel necessary. Now, economics uh, proper or mainstream economics uh, sort of follows this deductive view and has always done. So if you, you read the classical economists and go back to even um, Adam Smith, you would see that they, they reason about things using certain um, uh, assumptions. They also use uh, observations and things like that, of course. Uh, but the reasoning is sort of uh, a precursor to, to uh, the explanation. Um, today, uh, economics has sort of it has sort of two phases at once. So it, it yes, it uses theorizing by which they today mean only mathematical modeling. Um, and that is purely deductive, but at the same time, they're using data mining and uh, data analyses, trying to figure out what is going on. And that informs the theory. So they're, they're sort of doing both deductive and inductive work at the same time, which of course creates a, a well, just a mess. Um, and Austrians are, are totally opposed to that kind of mess. Now, the second uh, grand debate that I wanted to get into is uh, the socialist calculation debate. It was started by Ludwig von Mises, who was a student of Bombavark, who was uh, the second generation Austrian. So Mises was the third generation Austrian. Um, he wrote an essay in 1920 when he argued that socialism is simply impossible. Uh, and he used this uh, theory first method to come up with this and, and, and to figure out how, how socialism cannot work. He, he defined socialism in the economic sense. There is a, that is um, the common or, or social or state ownership of all the means of production. Uh, and in this situation, Mises argued, you can't figure out how to best satisfy people's wants. So uh, if you have only one owner of all this means of production, you cannot economically figure out which are more, more valuable and what are their valuable uses. You can technologically figure out that say you can use metal to uh, build a railway uh, and that's much better than using wood for instance, but you can't tell whether wood is economically better than metal or which metal is more economically uh, at suitable uh, for, for building that rail. What he meant was simply that, well, the economy is always attempting to produce in the present to satisfy consumers in the future. And we can't know exactly what consumers will value. So we have to base it on guesses. We know sort of what, what the resource uh, supply is like today, but how are we going to figure out how to use those resources in the best way possible to satisfy consumers of the future? To me, says the only way of you doing this was through a price system. So to have prices of, of the different factors of production. Now you can't have prices, and there's no reason to have prices at all if everything is owned by the same guy or the same or the same community or the same state, because there, there's no trade. So, but that means also that if you don't have prices, you can't figure out that say gold is dearer than iron. So, which means that that gold, you should economize more heavily, just like in the uh, invisible hand, 
whereas it, iron you can use iron more broadly and for for different uh, different lines of production because there is so much more of it and it's it's not that expensive. But if you don't have those prices, there is no such information available for the decision maker. Now, where do those prices come from? That's probably the the most important part of Mises's uh, Mises's uh, thesis. Well, they come from a number of entrepreneurs bidding against each other for the resources. So what do these entrepreneurs actually do? Well, they consider uh, starting a business or starting a line of production. And based on what? Well, they look around, they see, okay, what are, what are the prices like? And then they ask, how much do I think I can actually make off of this? What, will, what, can, I, what can I sell these things that I want, want to produce for to consumers? And based off of that, I can actually place bids for the resources. So I can choose resources based off of what I think my revenue will be, but I can also outbid others uh, using the value that I think that I will be, be getting from, uh, from, from what I'm producing, which means entrepreneurs are involved as a group in determining the prices of the factors of production. So the, re the reason the price of gold is much, much higher than the price of iron is that entrepreneurs uh, find more valuable uses for the little gold that exists and therefore are, are willing to uh, bid higher for gold as a means of production than they are for iron because there is much more iron available. So you're going you're gonna to be able to use iron for a lot of different things. And at the same time, when, when these entrepreneurs establish these prices, they determine the prices, that is really determining um, the relative values or the relative value contributions of these factors toward future consumer wants. While, while entrepreneurs as a group are, are determining these prices, each entrepreneur, of course, will need to uh, buy resources based off of those prices. So you can't have an economy that actually economizes on resources from a value perspective without a number of uh, entrepreneurs acting in competing with each other and trying to figure out the value. So it's also a, a, a bunch of problems in the market economy looking at it through this perspective, right? That uh, the reason the economy is an organism the way the classicals had it, and the reason the economy sort of automatically adjusts to new situations, to new information, adjusts to new innovations is because of this process of, of constant uh, entrepreneurial calculation. It's, as uh, Mises called it. Now, this was a, a big blow to economists at the time because most economists assumed that, well, if you just, the market economy is, is not efficient, right? You have plenty of competitors. Why don't you just have one big factory instead, uh, instead of having several? Why do, you, why do you have all these companies uh, wasting money on advertising and, and packaging and design and stuff like that when when they could really just produce the stuff and produce more of it, right? So they, they assumed that a sort of rational central planning of the economy uh, should be much more efficient. And here is Mises then arguing that, no, you see, the problem is that you can't economize at all in a socialist economy. So this, of course, started a, a big debate and a debate that, as I mentioned, the, the first essay was in 1920. Uh, Mises published a whole book on this called Socialism in 1922. The debate raged on through World War II. So it wasn't really concluded after, until after Mises' uh, magnum opus, Human Action, was published in 1949. That's when sort of the, the debate subsided, even though it, it sort of started again uh, today. Uh, unfortunately, there was no, no good uh, conclusion to this debate. So Mises' argument was uh, misunderstood uh, and interpreted from a, a sort of equilibrium perspective. So the, the, the most known, the most famous solution to his problem is, <clears throat> is that uh, was formulated by Taylor in, in 1929 and then re reiterated by uh, Oscar Lange in 1936 and 37, where they argue that, well, yes, you need prices. Mises was right, but you can, you can create those prices. This, you can have a central planning board uh, that collects all the prices and collects all the information necessary to formulate prices and adjust prices. So they can basically call, call all producers in the whole country or in the whole world 
and say, okay, what, where do you have shortages? Where do you have surpluses? <clears throat> and then based off of that, they can estimate a new price and that price will be the price to, for, for um, resources tomorrow. And, and there, thereby you can have the same kind of invisible hand, they argue. Well, the problem with this, of course, is that here you have um, the present determining prices of the future. Well, the value to consumers is not part of this at all. So it's not actually in, uh, directed towards consumer value. It's directed towards just use of resources and someone else has already decided what should be produced. Value does not enter the picture. So that's definitely a problem. And of course, it's, it's uh, in, the, in reverse, temporally speaking. So for Mises, it's the future value of, of consumers that determines the revenue that entrepreneurs expect to get, whether right or wrong. And that's how the, the basis for their bidding for resources in the present. So you see the future or the expectations about the future determine the, uh, the, the prices of the present. So in a sense, in a market, the present research, the resource prices are the future prices because they're based off of the future valuations of consumers. Whereas the socialist uh, so market socialist uh, solution to the problem was to instead let the present determine the prices of the future, which is quite reverse. Which it means that the prices will always tail um, actual actions. And what you get out of the system overall, well, whether it's valuable or not, we'll see. And you can't really economize either because those prices are just made up. Those prices are not based in, in actual consumer valuations that we, can, that we can rely on. Whereas in the markets uh, system, uh, the, the, the prices are based on what, what Mises referred to as the division of intellectual labor. That is all those entrepreneurs who are trying to create as much value as possible, but putting their own money and their own wealth at risk. So they are, yes, they are looking for profit. They're seeking profit and they might be even stupid in, in, in terms of just trying everything for profit. But the issue is also loss. But they do this and they personally will lose if they fail. So they're very, very uh, careful to get things right and also adjust as soon as they get some new information or, or get a new idea that they think is better. They will adjust as quickly as possible. So this debate lasted for a very long time. There's also a debate about capital with Frank Knight and uh, F.A. Hayek was uh, on the other side. Well, plenty of people on both sides, but those were the two most important. To Austrians, capital is not simply the capital letter K as it is in, in economic models today. Instead, capital uh, is all those capital goods that we use. And to Austrians, it's pretty obvious that a pencil is not the same thing as a locomotive. Well, it's obvious to everyone, of course, <clears throat> but in, in mainstream economic models, you would just look at the dollar value uh, and you would say, well, a pencil is this much of a locomotive. And then you can just transfer those values to, uh, between the production processes. Austrians disagree with this completely because the value, yeah, it, 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 it's important, but what matters in the real economy is what you can actually do with it. How many, how, how can you, uh, make a locomotive out of pencils. Well, you, you cannot. And, and, and how can you make a, a new machine out of an old machine? Well, you probably need to just uh, smelt the metal and, and create a new one, which is a very costly and tedious process. It takes time, it takes energy, it takes uh, lots of resources to do that. So you can't really treat capital as just the value of it in, in the currency. Instead, you need to treat capital as heterogeneous. And that capital can be combined in different ways. You can combine a certain number of workers and workers with certain expertise with this factory and this management and this these resources, and you get certain line of certain type of production. But if you combine them in a different way, you get different types of production, and these can be different uh, of varying degrees of effectiveness and, and so forth. So, capital is super important. Whereas you had the other side then arguing that well, what what really matters for the economy is the value of capital. Well, as we saw in the socialist calculation debate, Austrians have already said, well, the value of the capital, the value of the factors is really based off of entrepreneurs competing to create value for consumers. And they will put together whatever combination of capital they think is most economizing toward that valued end. So 
uh, and those combinations are limited. Those combinations are of different effectiveness. They're of different productivity. And depending on the prices, some of them are might be much better engineering-wise, much better technologically, but they are, are much worse economically because those resources could be much better, or better, better use, more value creative use elsewhere. So this entrepreneur trying to produce something else, he will go for something else, even though it might be the second, third or fourth best um, uh, solution, technologically speaking. So it's, it's an important observation that capital is in fact heterogeneous. And there was another debate. Um, you might've seen the, the rap videos online, uh, the boom, fear the boom and bust is one of them. Um, Hayek versus Keynes take two was the other one, I think. Uh, if you haven't seen them, uh, look them up online. They're really funny. But these are where we're discussion using the capital theory that was already established in the Austrians and, and in non-Austrians uh, and, and talking about uh, business cycles and how, how they come to be and how to solve them. And the Austrian view is simply that, well, the market as an organism, it will practically take care of itself. You don't need to meddle with it. And in fact, when you do meddle with it, you create a lot of problems. So the Austrians, um, the business cycle is about both the boom and the bust. So the reason we have these busts and these, these recessions is that we have already created a, a boom that was unsustainable. That was not really based off of entrepreneurship uh, towards consumer wants. Instead, it was uh, generated by uh, expanding credit. So when banks create a, new, a lot of new money, well, the, the market economy has already adjusted to the, the number of monies available uh, so the prices are expressed in the money available. Well, if you suddenly create a lot more money, then whoever gets the money first will be able to buy goods at prices that reflect the old money supply. So they have basically new free money, free uh, purchasing power, and the prices do not reflect that purchasing power yet, which means it's a redistribution from, for, to those who, who get that money first. And of course, then they can produce a whole lot because... Things seem uh, much more uh, profitable to them when they have access to this extra capital. Um, and so they, you create a boom in the, some sector or some sectors of the economy, like we saw the housing bubble, for instance, in, in, in the early 2000s, or, or the, the dot-com bubble and boom in the late 1990s. Um, you see this now probably in the finance sector and in uh, stock exchanges. And this... Uh, bubble will burst at some time because it is an unsustainable bubble. It's not based off of what consumers actually want and it's, it redirects resources from where they did most good, according to entrepreneurs, to where the new money uh, enters the system instead. Uh, so this, this creates a bust and the bust is really a, a, a correction of all the errors that were made because of this new, um, this new uh, credit. Now, the other view... Uh, Keynes, and as I mentioned before, Keynes is part of the, the dark side of economics, uh, is, is that there are basically in, in hence, inherent contradictions in the, in the economic system, in the market economy, so that it will simply fail a little now and then. And then someone needs to go in and kickstart uh, the economy and make sure that people do the right things again. And that, of course, is the government. So to Keynes, it was more a matter of meddling with the economy and saving the economy from itself. You can see now why I call this the dark side of, of economics, because they have a very, very different view of how the economy works. It's not an organism. It's not a, a, a sort of voluntary uh, interaction that, that creates an outcome um, that is a sort of, sort of an order. Instead, of it's, it's a chaotic place to these guys uh, with, with contradictions that will we will need to save, our, save us from ourselves, basically. So the Keynes government should go in and they should, should when we have a boom, which you consider to be sort of normal, um, the government should step in and tax uh, businesses and people more than usual uh, so that the, the economy does not overheat because he considered the economy would just go on in faster and faster in whatever direction it was going. So you need to cool down the economy and then when the crash comes, you can use those funds to invest and do public works projects and so forth uh, to create more jobs uh, and sort of stop uh, the downturn. So the, the role of the government is, is to step in and sort of 
um, flatten out uh, those ups and downs uh, to make make the economy well to make it work better in a sense. You can see how how these views are very different. Now this these uh, uh, debates all lasted uh, through World War II pretty much. After World War II, from an Austrian perspective, not a whole lot uh, was going on. This is when mainstream economics uh, developed very for highly formalized methods and mathematized their analysis. This is where uh, mainstream economists created the general equilibrium model and things like that. Um, Austrians were uh, marginalized uh, to say the least. Some have argued that Austrian economics didn't quite exist uh, during this time, but this is not actually true because there were uh, a number of important works being published and you had some uh, several researchers and, and scholars doing important work. So Murray Rothbard uh, produced a number of really important economics books in the, in the 60s uh, before he moved into policy and politics instead in, in the 70s. You had Kersner, who was Mises' student. Um, he wrote a, a, an essay on capital in 1966, I believe. And then he wrote his uh, highly influential book on entrepreneurship uh, in 1973. And after that, he's produced several other books on entrepreneurship as well. Um, but of course, this, this, what this indicates is that the school is not, it's not dead. Uh, it's just very marginalized. And there are very few proponents of Austrian economics. Even so, in 1974, Hayek receives the Nobel Prize in economics um, for his work on business cycles that he did back, back in the 1920s. Um, so that, that was sort of some of uh, part of a resurgence in, in a sense, but the real resurgence came in much later. Uh, so Austrian economics sort of managed to stay alive in a sense over the decades and produced some important work, but no one really noticed uh, except for those few who were Austrians. Now, come the, the financial crisis of 2007, 2008, which was something that Austrians um, predicted, or at least said that this will happen, couldn't say exactly when, because Austrian economics is not suitable for, for uh, precise predictions. But they could see that something was really, really wrong. And the way that, that housing uh, prices were going up and how the, the central banks were, were pushing new funds uh, and creating new credit and so forth, Austrians knew that there was going to be a crash and there was going to be a correction. Um, and, and when, well, who knows? What we know with the correction is that the sooner it comes and the less we meddle with it, the, the faster it will go away. But, but this one was pretty big. Um, so we saw that coming, and since no other school of thought and economics really had an explanation for it, uh, this created new interest in the Austrian business cycle theory. Uh, you have some examples, if you look online, you have examples of highly influential mainstream economists just weeks before the, act the actual crash, saying that, oh, this looks excellent, all the data are in the right place, all the numbers show that this is going to move on, go on forever, uh, and and there, we see no reason at all uh, to expect any trouble. Of course, then, then the crash happened and they were all, all uh, confused about why, why that was the case. Then after the Great Recession, you also had uh, Ron Paul running for president uh, here in the US twice, which he had a, a pretty big and especially vocal following. But because of his, um, his presidential bid, uh, a lot of people discovered Austrian economics because Ron Paul is an Austrian economist and Ron Paul is, uh, I think is on the board for the Mises Institute and things like that. So he, he's, he's well read in Austrian economics. Um, that created an inflow of, of people as well. So now Austrian economics sees, well, a, a huge resurgence. And, and how do we deal with that then? Well, one thing is, is sad, but true. And it is that um, Austrian economics is not really part of the academic discussion. It's not really part of academic research. It's sort of excluded from all of those things. Um, well, there are, are a number of Austrians in academia, like myself. Uh, it's not the case that you can publish research in Austrian economics in mainstream journals, for instance. Uh, you can't get research funding for, for Austrian economics. Nobody really cares about Austrian economics if they have at all heard of Austrian economics. So instead, <clears throat> since Austrian economics is 
is so focused on explaining the real world and what happens, uh, we have started moving into practice and uh, explaining to practitioners what is actually going on. So I write a column for Entrepreneur Magazine, for instance, uh, where I, in a sense, just translate uh, what I know about the economy as an Austrian economist. Uh, but I do that in, in a, using a language that entrepreneurs and, and business owners can understand. Um, and Austrian economics is very, very useful for, for decision makers and businessmen for the simple reason that we provide a, a fundamental understanding for how the market works, which helps them stay away from making stupid mistakes pretty much or uh, making errors that they didn't have to make. So we do this a lot. Austrian economics is actually a, a, a big uh, perspective and an important perspective in entrepreneurship studies. Uh, and, and also in, in management studies. So in the business school, but not in the economics department, Austrian economics is pretty influential. Now, we also need more theory here. So there, there's still um, in, even though Austrian economics sort of has a theory of entrepreneurship and has a theory of capital, and I mentioned both before, this makes Austrian economics different from mainstream economics for sure. But those theories are themselves kind of underdeveloped. So while we do have uh, Kersner's discussion on pure entrepreneurship as alertness, we don't really have much, much theory beyond that. And we don't have theory that, that say explains the actions of entrepreneurs uh, in the business cycle uh, theory. We also have a, a basic theory on, on capital as heterogeneous and, and with where you can combine capital in different ways but we don't really have a detailed capital theory yet. So those, those need to be developed. And my own work, of course, is in entrepreneurship. And I've, I've done some, some, what I think are, are important contributions to Austrian entrepreneurship theory, uh, looking at, uh, for instance, the, the promoter, as Mises mentions, that the promoter is the most important, uh, or a really important concept that economics cannot do without, because the, the promoter is is sort of the entrepreneur that creates those great changes in the economy. But he said, yeah, I, I can't define it using economic theory. Uh, so <clears throat> so we, we can't really say more than that, which of course sucks if you're, you're in economic theory. But I figured out a way to actually define it uh, theoretically in the way that Mises should have, uh, which means we can also, we can talk about the promoter. Uh, and we can therefore explain economic growth in a different way. We can get much further uh, into these discussions and 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 reintroduce Austrian economics as a, a a valid and very important theory for understanding what is actually going on in the world. Now, what happens in the future? Well, in the very near future, I'm working on a book um, that is at least tentatively titled Austrian Economics a Primer. Uh, it's supposed to be a very short book. Um, it's it's going to be about half the length of Henry Hazlitt's uh, uh, Economics in One Lesson. Um, but it's going to be the same <clears throat> type of uh, to the point, easy to understand kind of language. But this is supposed to be an, an introduction to Austrian economics, the whole school, the whole theory. Uh, so it's it's supposed to be which is also the problem uh, in writing it, but it's supposed to be a book that you can basically give to your grandma. So when your grandma says, well, what is this Austrian economics you're talking about? You should be able to just get the book out of your pocket, say, here, grandma, read this. And your grandma should be able to understand what, what it means. Maybe not all the details, but at least should be able to read it and understand it and, and figure that sort of thing out. So that's, that's the, the next thing that I, I think is very important. Um, this book will be, uh, released first half of 2022, I think. I think what, where we, what will happen in the future that is uh, more important than my own book is that I think that we're heading into a socialist calculation debate part two. So you might have, you might have heard of the MMT uh, people, the modern monetary theory, which is uh, very popular over here in the US, where they basically argue that uh, more debt and more deficits do not matter because the government creates all money. So the government can create as much money as they like. Uh, it doesn't really matter. The only thing you need to watch out for is inflation. And as long as you don't have a rampant inflation, 
all the money you create, <coughs> excuse me, all the money you create is actually free stuff. So the government can spend that money on different types of projects, say infrastructure and, and um, healthcare and what, what not else. And those things are simply free because this is just new money that the government creates and entrepreneurs, they say, cannot make, they cannot earn profits unless there is money. So government has to create money for entrepreneurs to make money. And by printing this new money, then we can get uh, idle resources, resources that are not used in, uh, at all or used for the wrong things. We can, get, we can direct those to be used in producing these things for government. So we can, in a sense, what they say is that we can, we can get new infrastructure and we can get free healthcare for all um, and we don't have to pay a dime for it. So all we need to do is for government to stop pretending that deficits matter uh, and that, that, that it matters how much money they print. Instead, they should just print as much as they can until, until there is inflation. And when the, whenever there is inflation, all you need to do is just tax people a little higher uh, and then inflation will, will go away and then you can continue um, getting free stuff. Now, this... Um, is, is highly popular, which is a little, it's sad from my point of view, but it's also uh, frightening. Um, and it shows also that people are fundamentally economically illiterate. Uh, to think what MMT proponents think means you can't have understood anything at all about economics or the economy. Um, so I think this will lead to a socialist calculation debate again. I mean, basically a debate on is it possible to get free stuff? Is, is it possible for the government to uh, direct resources at no cost or at very little cost? Um, and the answer to this, of course, is no. Um, but this debate will need to happen in, in a, well, publicly, in the public discourse, in policy discourse, uh, and also in economics journals. The issue now, compared to last time, is that when Mises wrote his article in 1920 and the debate that uh, kept on for for 30 years. In that debate, um, scholars were scholars in a different way than they are today. So they were interested in figuring out what the right answer is, what the logical answer is, and figuring out what assumptions are the true ones and what, what follows from those assumptions. That is not the case anymore. So the, the MMT is not really something that it is pushed in academia to begin with. So there's not a whole lot of scholarship behind it. Um, instead, the MMT was sort of founded by, um, by a, a guy who, who used to run a, a, a fund. Uh, a, and, and he was in the finance market. So he, he saw how, how government treated money and treated the monetary policy and then made a theory out of that. Um, so there's no economic basis. There's no economic understanding whatsoever behind MMT. So we can't really push back on MMT by pointing to the economic arguments because the economic arguments are not taken seriously. And, and this, I have discussed quite a bit with proponents of MMT myself. And the issue is that they have no clue about the most basic uh, things in economics, which means simply that if I am to de debate them and if I am to show them how, how their theory is wrong, I need to use different tools. And I need to use different strategies. Um, and we need to develop those strategies so that we don't lose uh, socialist calculation debate part two, because that could be pretty much the end of the world. Um, and, and it seems a lot of people, especially in policy, are very interested in, in this, this concept of lots of free stuff. Um, of course, that's not how the world works. If we could get free stuff, then we would probably have gotten that free stuff already. Um, and it's not, not, it's not a matter of, of government being able to create something out of nothing. Uh, and, and they're sort of forgetting, um, just like the socialists back in the day did, they're forgetting that consumers have their own wants and their own needs, and they have their own subjective valuations. Uh, in MMT, just like with the socialists of old, they, in a sense, tell us what we're supposed to want. And then they say, we can produce it for you and the way we have figured it out, which is, is wrong, the way we figured it out, um, we can do this for free, which sounds good. I mean, everybody wants something for free if we can get it. 
Um, the issue, of course, is that it's not for free. And the what we get is also not what we actually value. So this is a, a, a very big deviation from economic understanding and, and what, everything we've learned in economics for the past 300 years, which is to me is, is frightening. Um, but we need to figure out a way to to rebut this, and I think this is coming in the next in the next decade or so. Uh, this debate will 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 be a big one. And mainstream economics, <clears throat> even though mainstream economics is not MMT, mainstream economics has very little to say about this and has very little uh, to contribute in a debate on this. The reason is simply that they have deviated themselves so far from proper economic reasoning the way it was done before, as I talked about in the 1800s. So they, they have their models, they have their math, uh, they have their data mining, but they don't have anything else. So, so it's really up to Austrian economics and us Austrian economists uh, to defend well the world and defend reality against uh, this, this, new, uh, this, new, this new take on the dark side of economics. All right, so that's my presentation. I'd be happy to take your questions. Great, thank you so much, Beth. Um, we have quite a few questions coming in. Um, give me just a moment. Sure. Um, so we have a question from Abhinav, who is attending. Um, and... Abhinav, do you want to go ahead and ask the question? Uh, yeah, 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 sure. So, hi, Pai, thank you. Uh, thank you for this. Uh, I really like uh, being a part of this webinar. Uh, so I'm an MBA student and uh, I've always had an interest in Austrian economics. I have a copy of Human Action on my table right now. And I have always had this question of how does this help me as a professional? How does knowing uh, the effect of uh, market interventions by, by the government, by MMT we're talking about right now. So I know this, but I'm still just, you know, one guy. And I know Austrian economics is not prescriptive and there's not really much a singular act I can do. But what changes would you expect if more business managers and business persons were aware of Austrian economic principles? Oh, wow. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, that's a good question. What would I expect to be different if people learn about Austrian economics? Um, I would expect, well, a, a lot of, of structural things would, would change, but I think that businesses would be less management and more entrepreneurship, it, it, if I put it very, very briefly. <clears throat> what I mean by that is simply that in very many organizations, and you probably have as an MBA student learned about the cost plus method, for instance, which is a method of pricing based off of your cost. So this is something that, that I, well, I, I really hate this, but, but uh, uh, what, what it means is simply that you, you uh, figure out what the cost of production is, then you add your profit margin, then that is your price. And then you try to sell it at that price. This is a absolutely, well, it's absurd, uh, and it's absolutely the opposite of what should be the case. So what I always teach uh, in entrepreneurship is, this is obvious, but what I teach uh, business owners too is that what you need to do is figure out what would consumers be willing to pay for your product? How, what is the worth of the product to them? And then of course, what price below that value can you charge so that it becomes easy enough uh, to to sell it, meaning if the value is really high and you, you charge a price that is much lower, it's a benefit for the customer, which means the customer is profiting. It's, it's much easier for the customer to make the decision to actually buy the product, right? Now, based off of that price, then you turn around and your job as a business owner or as an entrepreneur is to figure out how can I produce this product at a, at a cost so much lower than this price that I can get a profit out of it, right? So it's exactly the, the opposite. So thinking about it as an Austrian, you start with a value and then you try to figure out how can I get there? And you make the decision to get there if you think you can make a profit and to not try to do that if you don't think you can make a profit. So it's not about the cost at all. The cost is a choice. The value is not a choice. And the value and the, the selling price is not really up to you. It's something that the customer decides. 
um, even though you have to try to figure it out, but they decide whether you did it right or wrong. So <clears throat> unfortunately today in many businesses, um, they use the cost plus method. So they do not actually try to capture the value and create the value. Instead, they just say, oh, we want to produce this product. Um, this costs us this much. Can we sell it at that price? Okay, let's do it. Let's do it. Well, this doesn't take into account what value you're actually creating, which means you're not actually economizing on, on the resources in society. So it's a very inefficient uh, way of using resources. Uh, and I would like to see this change. I mean, many entrepreneurs, unfortunately, use the same method, which means they fail. Um, and I, I would see, once see entrepreneurs use this method and also business owners to use this method. And I think this would create more, a more dynamic business environment overall for the simple reason that the decision to continue a line of production or the decision to adopt a new line of production would be based on your expected valuations or your expected consumer valuations of those, which means that you should much more easily abandon uh, a line of production, even if it might be profitable because there's more profits elsewhere. Uh, and, and you should more easily, well, you should keep your eyes open for other opportunities. So in that sense, I think we would have um, more businesses, more varied production, and in higher, probably higher profits too. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, that helps a lot. Thank you. I mean, uh, uh, my marketing class was always about value to the customer, value to the customer. And then the finance people would tell me, oh, look at the cost, you know, do the costing of it. So this helps a lot make you know, sense of what to do. Good. Yeah, you're right. In marketing, they actually get this right. Uh, and they understand that they have to, to use marketing to uh, inform customers of how they might use the product. So basically educate customers uh, in, in, in how they might value something. Of course, the customer still decides whether they want to or not, but marketing, they have the value theory, right? They don't have a value theory, but they, <laughs> they still get the value theory, right? And you write about any, basically any other business course you take, they, they, they do it upside down, all of it. Great, thanks, Pat. Um, we now have, Stuti, um, who has a question on MMT and hyperinflation in the US, and, or rather its absence. Um, Stuti, you go ahead. Uh, hi, am I audible? Yes. Yep. So first of all, thank you so much. It has been a very knowledgeable and insightful session. Uh, I am a student pursuing major in economics right now. So uh, the way that you explained the theory of boom and bust, right? And we know that because of the pandemic, we have seen a lot of governments printing a lot of money just to, you know, support the COVID-stricken economy. In fact, uh, all of the global US dollars that are there, 40% has been printed uh, like after 2020 or in 2020. So looking at this, uh, do can we expect uh, inflation or hyperinflationary situation in the near future? That's a very good question. And had you asked me, uh, say, in 2008 or 2010, I would have said, yep, we will see inflation. It didn't quite happen. Now, the reason for that is, well, there might be plenty of reasons, but we all this money that has been produced has simply not hit the economy for some reasons. So in, in some cases, I've, I've seen many arguments for, for why this is the case, but banks have been sitting on the dollars. Um, people have not been interested in, in spending as much or whatever it is. So the, 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 the dollars that have been created have not really entered the economy and therefore have not had an effect on prices. Now, will this be the case now too? Because like just like you mentioned, there's a whole lot of more dollars and a whole lot of more money everywhere uh, available. And this time, I mean, we've sent, sent money to, to consumers. So just, hey, here, go out and spend. And, and of course, there, there's a whole lot more money too. Um, this should have an effect, but it, it all depends really on, on where the money ends up. So uh, as I think right now, we are seeing a lot of this money ending up in finance. So the reason that we have all these 
uh, stock market uh, records, a new, new one set every month or whatever it is, and have for, for the past years. Uh, the reason for that is that that's where the money has gone. So the money that has left the banks, they've all gone into, I don't know, short-term lo loans or something like that in, into uh, stock markets, maybe in, into people's uh, retirement savings that are also in, in funds in the stock market. So in a sense, we're already seeing inflation, um, but only limited to the stock market. Uh, here in the US, we've seen rising prices. Sometimes, well, they start out saying that, no, the, the prices are not rising. Then they said, uh, yeah, they're rising, but it's just temporary. And now I think the latest one is that they're saying that, yeah, prices are rising, but that's a good thing. So <laughs> they're changing the story. Um, but the truth is that, yeah, prices are going up. So when I go grocery shopping, I can tell that it costs me a whole lot more now than it did just a year ago uh, for the same types of goods. <clears throat> uh, and this, I think, is only the beginning because with all this money out there and there's really no one trying to, they're not even considering the, the potential problems here. Uh, they're not even considering what, what will happen when all this money actually hits the economy. So for now, we have uh, the booming stock market and we have uh, all kinds of stimulus for for uh, uh, consumers and and we have uh, what is it Biden's three uh, two trillion dollar infrastructure package and then he added another seven hundred billion or whatever it was for defense spending which is uh, well this is bad in many ways <laughs> I would say but all of this of course is going to end up somewhere I mean you you can't you can't produce infrastructure without paying the workers. And when those workers get paid, I mean, most businesses over here, they're, they're desperate for hiring people. They can't find people to hire, which means if the government is to create these infrastructure projects, how are they going to find these workers? Well, the only way of doing that is to raise wages so that they attract workers from elsewhere. Well, raising wages means more purchasing power, means more money being around, which means they will uh, push up prices. So I think, I mean, I hate predictions because it's a great way of being wrong. Um, and of course, Austrian economics is not good at, at predictions either, but it's, it certainly looks to me as it's just as a consumer, as things are starting to look bad. And I don't, I don't see a willingness from, from central bankers or politicians to hold back in any sense. Instead, they're, they're going further in the same direction, which would be disastrous. And, but as, as an Austrian economist, my, my, the issue is, is structural, right? That, that all this new money, money is not neutral, so it will end up in certain sectors, but not in other sectors, which means those, those sectors will be able to buy resources that the other sectors will no longer be able to afford, which means you get overinvestment and overproduction of certain goods, not based on consumers' actual wants, but based off of where the new credit ended up. And you will get underinvestment and underproduction of goods where consumers would have wanted to see more, but those, those uh, sectors of the economy don't have access to the new money in the same, sense, uh, same extent, meaning simply that, well, they will have to produce less. And some businesses there will probably go under because they can't get the resources or the resources are much more, more pricey now than they were before. Uh, so this is a huge problem because we can't satisfy consumer wants to the same extent anymore. Hey. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank I you, think Pat. that answers a lot of my doubts. I had just one more question, which is regarding MMT. So the first time I encountered this theory and this concept, it like sounded very absurd to me as an economic student. So I just want to know that what makes it like so popular and how can we, you know, actually explain to people that how economically flawed this concept is? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, I, I wish that people were more economically literate because then we could talk to them and just show them that Look, look at this, this is nonsense, because it is nonsense. Um, I mean, when people call it magic, magic monetary theory, it's, it's actually true. I mean, it's based off of 
of a, a magical thinking that they can get a lot out of nothing. <clears throat> it's also, um, it, in a sense, it's a, a description of the monetary system, the way it's run in a, a fiat currency system with a central bank. Uh, so they describe it fairly accurately, but then they go on saying, that, oh, well, if this is how it works, we can do this even more and then we can get lots of free stuff, which doesn't follow at all. <clears throat> so uh, why is it popular? I think it's simply because it's free stuff. And many people have, have this, <clears throat> this view or this, this belief that the economy itself isn't really working well and there are many problems in the economy. So the government, <clears throat> all powerful government can step in and, and fix things. And here they have sort of a, a, what seems like a rationale for government to step in and save, save the world and create lots of free stuff. And people like free stuff. And the policy uh, recommendations, so the policy, policies that they, they, uh, pr that they promote in MMT are all these uh, progressive policies with lots of free education, free healthcare, more infrastructure, all this stuff. <clears throat> and they're, they're seem, they seemingly uh, present an, a rationale for that this is possible. Um, and whoever is not uh, economically literate will not be able to see how it is not possible because they will always, <clears throat> and I've debated many MMTers, especially online on my Twitter, um, and they all refer back to the same things over and over again, that when I say that this is not possible, there's a real economy, a resource, you wouldn't have more resources just because you have more money, which is an obvious point from an Austrian perspective. But then they will say, well, where does the money come from? Who creates the money? Well, yeah, the, the government does, but from there it does not follow that you have more resources. It does not follow that the government will be able to create more value using the resources that exist. Nothing of what, what they say follows from their sort of mantra that they have, that government creates money and therefore government has to create money or no one can make money because they don't understand what money is. Money is not simply the, the dollar bills or, or whatever. Money is the, the medium of exchange. And that's important because you reallocate resources, real resources that are used in production. And, and they also don't get the, the says law that, that your ability to de demand something in the economy is based off of your supply. So you have to contribute value into the economy before you can purchase anything from the economy. And that's how we can, can have a highly advanced division of labor and be super productive is through this. But they totally separate these things thinking that, well, if we just, if we just give people money, they can demand a whole lot more. And that was... It, magically have more products. And how do we talk to them? I don't know how we talk to them. I, I, I wish I had that figured out, but we obviously cannot use economic reasoning because they don't get it. They, they don't have this economic reasoning. Um, and I think there's a reason why, why there are so few economists who are actually MMT proponents. I mean, there are a couple, but those are, are the most... Uh, political ones that don't mind at all flushing economics down the toilet if it suits them uh, politically. So uh, the most famous one would probably be uh, Stephanie Kelton, uh, who was the, uh, the economics advisor under Bernie Sanders uh, in his presidential campaign. Uh, I've seen uh, Paul Krugman starting to get closer to MMT. He was very opposed to it at first, but he gets closer and closer. Um, and the reason for that is obvious too. He, he wants to see, he's a proponent of big, glorious government and, and whatever argument gives him glorious government, but that's an argument he's going to support. So we're going to see some more people uh, pro promoting and, and accepting uh, MMT and they're all going to be for, for political reasons, not economic reasons. Right. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. Um, the next question is, um, so you've written that entrepreneurs should aim to be good monopolists. Um, the word monopoly, a monopolist has a very negative connotation to it. So how do you see you know, an entrepreneur trying to um, aim to be a good monopolist benefiting the society? 
Well, um, I mean, monopolist simply means, means that there's one seller, right? So uh, it, with any innovation, it begins with one seller. So every innovation necessarily is a monopoly to begin with before there are competitors. And no one would really claim that, oh, innovation is bad because it's done by monopolists. Because no, a, a monopoly is sort of the result of, of, of innovating something. And if it's successful, then you're not going to be a monopolist anymore because other, others will copy what you're doing. And, and, and that's, that's part of the argument that you, you should be innovative and create new valuable things for consumers and thereby be a monopolist. The other part of the argument is, is that if you are so good at producing something that, that you can offer those goods at so low prices to consumers that no one else can compete with you and make a profit, <clears throat> that means other entrepreneurs are going to stay out of that market. That means that you will continue to be a monopolist for as long as you benefit consumers more than anyone else is able to. That's not a bad monopoly. That's a very good monopoly because it means you don't even need more people to, to produce those things because you have found a way that is so darn effective and so darn productive that it's cheaper than anybody else can do it. So uh, in, in that sense, you're, you're a good monopolist, right? An innovator or you're so much better than everybody else. A bad monopoly would be a, a monopoly uh, that is protected, uh, especially through, through government. So a, a you're the only seller of something because the government has says that, said that no one else can, uh, or that there are barriers to entry, or that there's a license, or, or all of these things. Um, and in that case, you can raise prices, just like in, in typical monopoly theory, you can raise prices higher than you otherwise would be able to because you are protected. In that case, you are sort of transferring wealth from your customers to you because you are protected. And no one else will step in and un undercut your prices because they're not allowed to. <clears throat> so monopoly can be both good and bad in my world. Um, uh, and it, it doesn't really follow. I mean, yeah, we hate monopolists uh, and monopolies as consumers because usually that means that there's just one seller and we, we sort of have to buy from them or, or not. <clears throat> but that, uh, that is only an issue if they can actually exploit that situation. And as an innovator of something new, you cannot, because if you if you have if you raise the price or if the price is too little little too high, others will enter immediately and you will not have that benefit anymore. And the same thing if you are more effective and more productive than than anybody else is, if you raise the price, then they can make a profit again, so they will enter. Um, so you can't really exploit those situations. You can only exploit it if you're protected by government. And I think it's important to see this distinction. So when I say entrepreneurs should be a good monopolists, what I'm really saying is they should be really good innovators and create a lot of value. Right, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, we have two questions that are related, so I'll just club them. Um, so one is that, what is it about empirical economics and equilibrium models that you know, make policy tend towards intervention and big government? And what is the Austrian economist's view on government intervention and when it is required? When is it required? Okay, um, I think the answer to the first question has a lot to do with uh, uh, market failures, <clears throat> and a market failure is is typically defined as the real observable economy being different and therefore inefficient compared to the model. In the in the sort of uh, very simplified case, you would have a, a general equilibrium model where you would <clears throat> calculate what is the efficient outcome, meaning you assume that everybody has perfect information, um, all resources are perfectly liquid, <clears throat> capital is a capital letter K, it doesn't matter if it's a pencil or a locomotive, uh, so you can just transfer bits and pieces of it back and forth easily. Um, in this world, what is, what is uh, calculably efficient has nothing to do with the real world. So, uh, but if, you, if that is your starting point, you can see that, well, obviously there's too little, uh, too, too few pencils produced, say. Well, how do we get more pencils to be produced? Well, government can step in and subsidize pencil makers. 
or government can step in and produce more pencils. Right? So the solution then seems to be that, well, government can just, because we have the model and we've already calculated that what is being produced right now is not efficient. We can produce, we should have more pencils of fewer locomotives. Okay, then government can step in and tax locomotive manufacturers and subsidize pencil makers. So in a sense, these, these models, they facilitate government especially if you assume that government has the knowledge and can make the solution possible, uh, which is asking a lot. I mean, it's assuming that government doesn't make errors or that your model is not flawed or anything like that. But it, it, <clears throat> any, any type of model of efficiency uh, opens up for finding inefficiencies and if you can find an inefficiency, you can also say why there is an inefficiency, or at least think that you know, and thereby you can say, well, we should fix this, and this is how. So in a sense, I would say all of mainstream economics pretty much um, facilitates uh, uh, government meddling with the economy and manipulation of the economy because the economy is not efficient. And Austrians would say that, yeah, the market is not efficient. It's just unbeatable. So... Um, it's never efficient. That's why we have a, a process. And, and that's why entrepreneurs figure out new ways of, 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 a, of a creating products and new products to create. Uh, we're figuring this out all the time. And, and that's why, why new businesses are started. That's why, why uh, entrepreneurs make earn profits. This is why businesses go out of business because we're still trying to figure this out. And if that is the case, then you can't really say that, oh, too few pencils today and too, too many locomotives because they're produced for a reason. Entrepreneurs uh, with skin in the game chose to not produce more pencils because they thought it wasn't value, valuable enough. That might have been wrong. We don't know yet. And they chose to produce more locomotives. Well, that also might be wrong. We don't know yet. But that's what that's their best guess, and that's the economic calculation argument, right? Um, Austrian's view on on uh, on a government regulation is it's a tricky question because. Austrian economics does not have a view. So Austrian economics is a positive theory. So it's, it's, um, it just tells us what is and explains how the economy works. That's it. Uh, so whether, whether you want government or not, that's, that's a political issue. It's different. However, um, Austrian economics, like I just mentioned, is, is not as, as, it doesn't facilitate or make it seem like government uh, intervention is a free for all because it isn't. Um, and an Austrian economist would be much more humble to the economy overall as an, as an organism and would also say that, well, we don't, there's so much we don't know. So if we start meddling with it, the risks of creating greater errors and more problems than we're actually solving, those are huge risks. So we can't just assume that we know everything, step in and, and, and as Superman and, and save the day um, because we can't. We can understand what is going on, but we, we can't replace entrepreneurs. And that was Mises' argument, right? That you can't have a central planning committee or a government step in and, and replace all those thousands, millions, billions of entrepreneurs who are, who are putting their own money on the line. Um, so a more humble approach you, you can support uh, government intervention. And I think even Hayek supported um, increasing liqu liquidity during uh, financial crisis and things like that. So <clears throat> there are definitely um, uh, situations where Austrians can recommend and can support regulations and, and government intervention, but usually not much more hesitant than others. Right. Thank you, Per. Um, your answer also answers another question that we had on, you know, entrepreneurship failure and market failure. So what would be the distinction between the two? Um, we are at the end of time, but um, maybe would you be willing to take one more question? Sure. Let's do one more. Sure. Um, we have a question from Giridha. Um, Giridha, would you like to go ahead and ask? Question. 
Hi, Kirinder, can you hear us? Sure, um, maybe I'll go and ask. Uh, hello, oh. am I heard yeah, now? Please. Yes, yeah, please. Yes, you are. Uh, this is about uh, the ease of transactions uh, between uh, nations that uh, it is traded in individual national currencies. Uh, there was a proposal by economist on a transnational currency which uh, Drucker mentioned that it is possible. Do you think that India can lead a transnational currency but with agreement from all governments? And India can what? Can create a transnational currency, which means one <laughs> currency with 149 agreed currencies, like what the IMF has SDR now. So we could trade with Africa or New Zealand or anywhere in one transnational currency. Well, I, I think definitely <clears throat> that a, a world currency is a, a possibility. I'm not sure it is very possible if the government creates one. So uh, we had one before. Uh, it was gold. It was being used practically globally. Um, and as, as long as you have a, a, a sound money regime in the sense that money is actually based on some resource, uh, such as gold, but it could be anything really, then you have, uh, then it, it would work. Uh, if you... If I understand your 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 question correctly, if you create a a world currency based off of the fiat currencies that exist out there already, <clears throat> that's basically a a, a fixed exchange rate system. Um, and we've had those before. The the problem with that is that you still have governments who are um, sovereign with respect to their currency so they're still using their own currency domestically but then there's a fixed exchange rate with a a with sort of global trade um that's a problem uh for for the same reason as as we, we see within the european union for instance where countries like greece they can issue a lot of euros <clears throat> and sort of uh stimulate the economy to use a Keynesian terms um, but where do they get the resources well it really increases their purchasing power in Greece at the expense of everybody else's so in a sense you saw a flow of resources from basically northern Europe to Greece <clears throat> and who who were getting a free-for-all pretty much because they were creating all this this new new money uh, and they could create it of course because well they were allowed to, and because it wasn't based in any actual resource, you can't create more gold just because you feel like it. Um, so, I think it it it's a good idea to have uh, currencies uh, that are used in in bigger areas and that ex uh, include more people. So, I, I think a, a world currency is not a bad idea at all, unless it is a fiat currency, because that that means we can get enormous problems out of it. Um, a world currency as such as the gold standard uh, was only a good thing because it, it, it forced uh, governments to stay within their means and actually um, have budgets and not overspend, which they all do today. Um, at the same time, there were no exchange rates uh, fluctuations. The uncertainty of trading internationally was much lower. Um, there was none of those uh, financial instruments where you try to guard yourself against currency fluctuations and things like that. So this has created a new market that is just basically protecting yourself from the downside that was created by governments. So uh, a transnational currency, yes, but with the caveat that it needs to be a be sound money. Right. Thank you so much, Per. Um, due to the paucity of time, we may not be able to take other questions, um, but we really appreciate you taking the time out for us. And it was a very insightful talk. And you know, a lot of uh, insights actually also came from the answers that you gave to the questions. So thank you on behalf of the Center for Civil Society and uh, thank you to the participants for attending the e -Batter. Thank you very much.